Today we're going to look at an unlikely passage for a Christmas message. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 that tells us that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. You know, as a Christian, as we grow, we're to look more and more like Christ. But we have an enemy that's out to hinder that growth and stunt that growth. But the good news of Christmas is that Jesus was born into this world. He took on human flesh to destroy the works of the devil that hinder our growth, that hinder us from coming to Christ. Join us today as we look at this message from 1 John 3. He came for destruction. Good morning. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We're going to take a break from Revelation for about six weeks. My plan is for us to go through Christmas and do something different and then have um, a message or two there at the first of the year um, that will be a little different and we'll come back to Revelation. We'll pick up in Revelation 8 um, after the 1st of January. But we want to um, we want to take a little bit of time to work through a Christmas series, and I want to start off today by showing you some pictures. Um, showing you, have you guys got the the uh, yeah this picture right here? So I don't know if you know it or not, but the things in this picture are, these are Christmas pictures. These are these are Christmas pictures here. I didn't know about all these. Some of them I learned about. Some of them I learned about. And my boys told me, I didn't know about the KFC, but I'll tell you about all these, okay? All these are Christmas things, all right? First is the Christmas pickle. Some of you may know about the Christmas pickle. Supposedly, in Germany, this is a German tradition where they would hide a pickle in the Christmas tree. And then you hunt for the pickle, and if you find the pickle, it supposedly brings you good fortune throughout the year, or you get to open the first gift, or whatever that is, right? The Christmas pickle. But... Is I've done some digging. I'm not sure that this is true. That might be a whole myth. It might be an American creation that people said came from Germany and it's made its way back to Germany. I'm not really sure what's true about the Christmas pickle, but it is such a thing that somebody gave us. We have a Christmas pickle ornament at our house where somebody gave us a Christmas pickle. Anybody know about the Christmas pickle? There's a few, all right. So, oh, y'all were German. Yes, is this a German thing? Is this a German thing? I'll leave it alone. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I did find out, and this was evident news to me. Did you know that the first KFC in Japan opened in 1970, and in the years that followed, there was some promotional things that they did around Christmas time. Uh, things like um, Kentucky is Christmas, and you know, if you think about it, Colonel Sanders kind of looks like Santa Claus if you put a red hat on him, you know. And so they did some promotional things, and so somewhere along in about the mid 70s. It started to catch on, and Japanese people, like, it's a traditional thing to eat KFC at Christmas. KFC in Japan, is the, that is the most profitable time of the year for them. You can cater KFC to your house, you know, like have KFC cater your Christmas dinner at your house. And even though they're not really celebrating Christmas, they eat a lot of KFC, and they've even tried to stretch it out. You know how we get like Black Friday gets stretched out into a, you know, a whole season? That's what KFC does to try to deal with the crowds of Japanese people that are trying to get to KFC on Christmas Day. And so they stretch this out, and, and that's a really profitable thing in Japan at Christmas. The other picture up here is roller skates. In Caracas, Venezuela, when they have Christmas morning, when they do mass on Christmas morning, somewhere along the way, it became tradition for people to roller skate to mass on Christmas morning. And so on Christmas morning, they close the streets down and people, kids sleep with their skates at night and they they roll themselves to church on Sunday morning. They, they roller skate through the streets to mass on Sunday morning. These may seem like weird things that you don't associate with Christmas. These things, aren't, these things on this thing are not things that we initially think about or associate with Christmas. It's not a candy cane. It's not a nativity scene. It's not a Santa Claus. It's not those things that we think about when we think about Christmas decorations, right? It's not images related to Christmas. 
they, they're strange. But they're no stranger than other things that you have associated with Christmas, like a Red Rider BB gun or a leg lamp, Roger, or, uh, you know, phrases like, keep the change, you filthy animal. You know, those things don't seem like Christmas either, but we have them as Christmas in our brains. It's these weird associations with these things that aren't really Christmas, but they're Christmas. Last year, around Christmas, I know that you all remember because you remember everything I preach and you hang on every word. Last year at Christmas, we did something very traditional at Christmas. The Christmas series that I preached last year was called A Thrill of Hope. And we talked about how, you know, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And we talked about how Jesus coming is, uh, is, means hope for a sin-gripped world that's hurting and in need. That's what we talked about last Christmas, and that's true. This Christmas, we're going to take like a non-traditional approach. Last Christmas was more, like a, was more like a nativity candy cane. This is going to be more like a roller skate or a pickle. You know what I mean? It's a different Christmas series this, this, this Christmas. This, this year, we're going to do a sermon series called Why He Came. And through this sermon series, we're going to be looking at some reasons that you may not suspect why Jesus came. If you were to say, why did Jesus come? As Colton said this morning, we love the fact that Jesus was born to this earth because it means peace and hope and joy. And it means that we can have eternal life as Christians. But there are a few phrases in scripture that some of them Jesus makes himself. And he says, I came for and then he names some things that we would not expect in Jesus' coming. And so this Christmas, we're going to look at why he came. And the reasons why he came are not going to be the first things that you're going to think about. For instance, this morning, the title of the message is, He Came for Destruction. He Came for Destruction. Let's look together in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 4 through 10. Let's read together. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Here it is. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Before we look to this passage, and we're going to focus on that phrase in just a minute, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's going to be the basis of the message this morning. But when you read this passage, there's... That's not the general thrust of the, of the text. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about what the, like the context and the background of what John is writing about here and, and put it in the frame of what it means for Jesus to come and destroy the works of the devil in your life and mine. In John, 1 John chapter 3, John is telling us that not everyone who claims the name of Christ is a genuine believer in Jesus. And he doesn't go through, as he's trying to talk about counterfeit Christians, he doesn't go through and start listing qualities of counterfeit Christians. He doesn't describe the counterfeit. What he does is he describes the genuine. And if you look at what he's saying in this text, he's talking a lot about righteousness. And he basically has two big points in this section of Scripture. True children of God are going to practice righteousness. They're going to love God and other people. That's what it says. So, like, I'll tell you a great verse. Just take it for a minute. Let's reread verse 10. Look at verse 10 because it's a great summary verse. And it comes right in the middle of this text. It's the last verse that we read. And you can see in it an outline of the chapter a little bit. He says it's evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. So he's contrasting those two. And then he gives us two, how, how you can tell, two reasons you can tell. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. 
And so it, kind of interestingly, that verse is like a midpoint. And if you look at the verses prior to verse 10, where the verses that we read today, the focus on this is on righteousness. True Christians live a life of righteousness. Those are the verses we read and we're going to focus on. If you look at the verses after verse 10, the ones that follow in chapter 3 and even in the beginning of verse 4, the focus is on loving God and loving others. You know, later on in, in, um, in, in 1 John, it's going to talk about him being love. God is love, right? All those sort of things. Those verses that we're familiar with because it's telling us that true Christians are going to practice a life of righteousness. They're going to live holy lives. And a part of that is, is loving others and loving God. When he talks about that, one of the commentators I was reading this week said that this connection is, is that love is righteousness in relation to others. So it's still righteousness in this idea. It's sticking with the same theme throughout. And so we're going to focus on those verses that deal with a Christian living a righteous life. Because it is possible for you as a believer in Jesus Christ to live a righteous and holy life. The Bible calls us as believers in Christ Jesus to be holy as he is holy. That's not possible on your own. It's only possible because Jesus has come and he has come to destroy the works of the devil. Now let's focus on that for just a little bit. Let's think about our focus verse is there in verse 8 when it tells us that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You know that the devil goes by many names in Scripture. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons why this is so good for us to do right here at Christmas is there's a lot of ties between what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks and Revelation. We, we're not going to be in Revelation, but there's a lot of connections here, right? Devil. The word devil is the idea of him being an accuser. You know, he's an accuser of the brethren. He, he accuses us before each other, like he tries to divide us before each other. But I believe that he's an accuser, uh, you know, like you look in the story of, of Job, you know. God, why would you love those awful people, you know? And he breathes in your ear lies, the same ones like Valerie described in her video. You're not worth anything. You're, you, you could never, God could never use you. He's an accuser. We use sometimes the word Satan, you know, which is, is not so much accuser as it is like adversary or enemy. The New Testament epistles talk about the devil and describe him as the prince of this world. In Revelation, you find names like Abaddon and Apollyon, which are words that mean destroyer. He comes to kill and steal and destroy. In Revelation, you see a picture of Satan as a dragon, this old serpent this old dragon that's been deceiving from the beginning, right? When we think about the devil, what we're thinking about is a person whose chief activity, this, this, this supernatural being whose main activity is to oppose the work of Christ and to oppose God's people. We don't have time to get into all of that origin story. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people that want to want to focus on those verses in Ezekiel and Isaiah. But no matter what you believe about the devil and his origin, which is a mystery in some ways, what we know about the devil is he is a created being and he is not omnipotent. He is not all powerful. He is not omnipresent. He has an army of demons that makes his work possible in multiple places at one time. But I'm telling you those things that it is in our minds, sometimes we elevate the devil to a place that we feel like it's impossible for anyone to triumph over him. But as we've been looking in Revelation, the lamb who was slain with a spoken word, with a spoken word, it's not some, it's not some epic battle where the devil has a chance of overcoming you understand? There is not, he is able to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is able to destroy the works of the devil because there is no comparison in power. Is the devil craftier than me and you? But is he more sovereign than our Lord? In fact, he's not sovereign at all. And so when we start thinking about the devil, keep that in your mind. Remember that as we think about that today. And think for a moment about how practical that statement is. As I'm reading that passage, you may be reading that passage and the temptation would be to say, oh, David, this is really theological. I'm not sure that I... Good theology 
is so practical for your life. And to recognize that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. When you read all that stuff about righteousness and and sin and, and all those things, you're reading something that seems very theological. But this is intensely practical for your life. When we talk about the fact that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, the works of the devil are any of those evil attitudes, those sinful actions in our life that hinder our connection to Christ, that stunt our growth in him. And so do you know what it means for Jesus to come and destroy the works of the devil? That means that just like in the video that we watched, that Val, that where Val, Val was sharing her story, That means that he came to break every chain of addiction that a person has. It's possible for that addiction, those chains of addiction to be broken because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The little temptation, I want you to think for a minute about the the things that you struggle with. The places where you fall and you stumble and you falter and your flesh tends to win over the spirit in your life. Think about those places, those temptations in your life. Do you understand that he came to destroy the works of the devil, which means those things do not have to dominate you, that you as a believer can have victory over those temptations that come into your life. Even the places where you're comfortable, the places where you fall back to, the places you run to, when you when you get into to a, a, a spiritual pickle, those places where you go back to in, in weakness, he gives us victory over those things. Do you understand that when Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, that means that he has come to expose the lies that the accuser would breathe into our ear. You understand how important that is? The lies that come that that he tells you that bring about anxiety in your life and depression in your life that bring about pride in your life. You know, the devil whispers lies in our ear about others, but he whispers lies into our ear about you. And sometimes his lie is, you're better than this. You, You deserve more. Just take that for yourself. It's a prideful lie. It's a, it's a lie that produces pride. But sometimes he breathes in your ear and he says, you're not worth anything. I can't believe that he would die on the cross for you. You're worthless. Those lies, he's come to expose them and to destroy all of that. He's come to destroy the works of the devil. And so if, you're, if you have anger that bursts forth out of you, you can't, you can't keep calm. It seems like your temper is out of control. You have this anger within you. He's come to calm all of that. You can keep going down the list. We could talk for days about the, what he's done to destroy the works of the devil. That's what we're talking about. Now, we're going to start talking about it. We're going to look at it in, in several verses around this text, and we're not going to walk straight through. Uh, on my computer this week, um, the, the, the sermon has done this. Parts of the sermon have, have changed and moved and copied and pasted. And so I hope they're all in the right spots in my notes or we may have an exciting adventure here. But, but I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to walk through it. We're not going to start in verse 4 and go to the end. We're going to walk through it in a little different way. I just want to turn your attention to a few verses we're going to focus on for a minute at a time in looking at what's happened in, in the text. All right? Let's start there in verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You could also go back up to verse 5, and it tells us that you know that Jesus appeared in order to take away sins. How are the works of the devil destroyed? Well, those verses tell us first that the works of the devil are destroyed by the sacrifice of the Son. First thing that you need to note today is that the works of the devil are destroyed by the sacrifice of the son. We love Jesus because he died on that cross, he bled for our sins, and he rose again on the third day to give us eternal life. Ultimately, that is how the works of the devil were defeated and destroyed. And so when you look at this passage and it tells you something like, Verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You say, well, David, he died on the cross, and I see the works of the devil all around me. I see the work of the devil in my own life, David. What do you mean he came to destroy the works of the devil? 
You know, the Bible uh, wasn't written in the king's English. And so you have to go back to some original words to really understand some meaning and to make sense sometimes. You get the wrong impression if you just read it in English, right? And so the word destroy is, when you look at that word in the original language, it doesn't actually mean annihilate or end. The word is luo, and the word means to loosen, to undo, to dissolve anything that's been bound or tied together. Jesus came to loosen the bonds of sin. Jesus came to give victory from sin. The verse is not saying that he came to eradicate sin. Now, will he ultimately eradicate sin? Yes. That's why we're studying Revelation. But in the meantime, in the here and now, until that day comes, it's not that that the works of the devil are annihilated or ended. You need to read that verse in thinking about what Jesus did on the cross made the works of the devil inoperative. Adrian Rogers had a great, has a great illustration about this. It's always stuck with me. He's talked about, you know, the, the, uh, you know a rattlesnake. If you cut the head off a rattlesnake, you know, the, it'll squirm till the sun goes down, they say, you know? And that rattlesnake is writhing around. It's moving around there on the ground, and it's dead. The head is gone. It's dead. It can't bite you anymore. It can't sting you anymore. Now, the head will get you. I know the teeth. I got a look over there from Tawana. But that, that thing writhing around on the ground will, will not bite you, right? That body that's moving around, it's dead. It's dead. But what's happened is, is that, that that's what we're seeing. The devil's in those death throes. The devil is, there's a lot of activity, but he's been defanged. The power of sin has been defanged. It has been, it's been made inoperative. That's the way that scripture speaks about it. Listen at some of these verses. Colossians chapter two and verse 15 says that when he died on the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities. He put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him and what he did on the cross. There's another great verse I like. Listen to this passage, let's read it. It might not seem to apply here, but let's read it and then I'll explain. Luke 11, verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. In this passage, in that little verse that Jesus is talking about, Jesus is the thief. The image is of a strong man who's guarding his house, who rules this thing, who has the armor. When the strong man guards the house, it's hard for somebody to get in and and take over that house. But when someone stronger than the strong man comes in, he binds the strong man and he rules the house. Think about, pick, think about those times in Scripture when Jesus comes upon someone who, and he casts a demon out of that person. You know, think about that, that man over in Gadara cutting himself. There was a strong man who was ruling that house. There was one who was in control of that man who it seemed impossible to get rid of him. It seemed impossible to disarm him. But on that day, there was one that was stronger than the strong man that showed up, bound that power in his life, and you see the man sitting up, clothed, speaking in his right mind. Because the strong man had been bound, and that's what happened on the cross. Jesus, what he did on the cross, he he eradicated the power of sin. We can have victory over sin. Howard Marshall says the task of Jesus was to undo whatever the devil has achieved, to thwart whatever he tries to do. Our study of Revelation is so connected to this, isn't it? Because even though at current, even though right now what we're seeing is we're seeing Jesus, what he did on the cross disarmed the powers of evil and made it possible for us to have victory, we look forward to a day when he completely eradicates the works of the devil. And destroyed will mean annihilate and end. In Revelation chapter 20, in verse 10, it says that the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This victory 
that Jesus won at the cross is what ultimately brings about a defeat for the, the destruction of the works of the devil. And we surrender our, when we surrender our lives to him, we enjoy that victory. Let's take a look at another verse. So I think that the works of the devil are destroyed by the sacrifice of the son. But secondly, I want you to see in this passage that the works of the devil are destroyed by the seed of the spirit. By the seed of the spirit. Go down with me to verse 9. And look at, at, at verse 9 with me. The, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning. Because he has been born of God. In this passage, when John is talking about counterfeit Christians versus genuine Christians, the idea here is, is that when temptation comes, when our flesh has desires apart from him, we have no resources to rely on to help us to defend against any of that. We succumb to all of that. It's impossible to have victory over sin in that moment because our old nature, the flesh, that's what it craves after. And there is no hope for victory in that regard. But Christians have been given a new nature. We have become new creatures in Christ. And when you come to Christ, when you trust in what he, when you trust in the sacrifice of the son, you trust in what he did on the cross. When we do that, he indwells us with the power of his Holy Spirit. When you came to Christ, you may not be able to understand the mind of God, but God has put his mind in you. He's put his Holy Spirit in you to direct you, to guide you, to convict you of sin, to give you the strength that you need in that moment of temptation to provide a way of escape. This Christian has this new nature. Here, John calls that uh, God's seed. But just looking throughout scripture, you'll find other names for it. Romans and Colossians, other places talk about this new man versus old man, old man versus new man picture in our lives. Uh, Galatians talks a lot about the flesh versus the spirit. I've used that phrase numerous times today. Um, First Peter, other places in, uh, like here, it talks about uh, God's seed, but in First Peter, it talks about a corruptible seed. That is, it, that is in us before we know Christ. This corruptible versus the spiritual. But one of my favorite pictures of that is, is the first Adam and the last Adam and the difference that happens there, right? Listen to this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. All of us are like Adam. We're made of dirt, he has put life into us. We resemble and look like the first Adam, right? But then it says in the last part of that verse, even though Adam, but the first Adam became a life-giving spirit, the last, I mean, uh, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And for those of you that know Christ as your Lord and Savior, the last, he was the last Adam. He died for us in that way. He is the one who has created in us this new creation. And not only do we have to bear this image of the, the man of flesh, the first Adam, when we come to Christ through his Holy Spirit, we can bear the image of this last Adam, this life-giving spirit. We can, be, we can look Christ-like. He, he gives us his righteousness in order that we may live in a way that is holy and right because he has put that in us. He's put his spirit in in us, as he describes it here, as God's seed. One of the commentators I was reading this week, I, I want to say that this was Warren Wiersbe describing what a Sunday school teacher had, had, had told them. So this is Warren Wiersbe's quoting a teacher that he had when he was young. And he said, the Sunday school teacher said, there are two atoms living in each of us. When temptation comes knocking at our door, if I send the first atom to the door, I'll sin. But if I send the last atom... I'll have victory over sin. Thus, the works of the devil are destroyed. You see, the new nature that he has put in us makes this possible. How are the works of the devil destroyed in your own life? Well, it starts with the seed of the spirit that he has indwelled us with. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 7 that you will recognize them by their fruits. And so when you think about whether you are living in light of the first Adam or the second Adam, verse 10 of our passage here in 1 John 3 tells us that it's going to be evident. 
if you're sending the first Adam to answer the door and there's no one but the first Adam to answer the door, it will be obvious in your life because there will never be any resistance to sin. There will never be any. The flesh in us loves sin, but the spirit despises it. And so a Christian will live in light of that spirit. A Christian will, will hang on to that spirit and will grow in Christ's likeness. And, and as he says, you will recognize them by their fruits. It's evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil because the children of God are going to practice righteousness. They're going to love their brother. But the one who's not of God will not. They don't have any other resources to rely on because they're not indwelled of his Holy Spirit. The works of the devil are destroyed by the sacrifice of the Son and the seed of the Spirit. But the final thing that we need to think about that gets down personal to us in our everyday lives is that the works of the devil are destroyed by submission to God. Where the water hits the wheel for me and you is what we choose to do in that moment where we're going to send somebody to answer the door. You see, he has given us all the resources we need to honor and obey him. The question is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have all those resources in his Holy Spirit, God's seed has been put into you, how do you, do you rely on the Spirit or do you rely on the flesh? This passage is telling us that a genuine believer will not live in continual sin. Go back up to verse 4. Let's focus on verse 4 for just a minute because it tells us that everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. This is a little bit of a description of a counterfeit Christian, right? Or at least one who doesn't know Christ. Notice what it says there. It's, um, ESV is a good translation of this. Whoever, everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. King James is not as good here. King James says something like, um, whoever committeth sin practices lawlessness. And the idea is, is that the word is not just if you commit a sin. I mean, every act of sin is lawlessness. But the, what the passage is trying to convey is, is that a person who's a believer in Jesus, that will not be their life. Their life, their, their regular practice will not be lawlessness. Their regular practice will be devotion to King Jesus until he comes again. You see... As Christians, we are to be devoted to King Jesus. We're not rebels. It's not lawlessness that we hold to in our lives. It's, it's devotion to him. And so a true, genuine believer who's devoted to Jesus, who's living in devotion to him, while they may sin on occasion, Colton said that this morning, Valerie has shown us that on occasion this morning, all of us, all of us in the room that know Christ as Lord and Savior, we do not live perfect lives. But sin should not be the consistent habitual pattern in our lives. The Nile River is a great example of this. Have you guys got the Nile River picture? So the Nile River, you know, is the longest river in the world. But there's another interesting fact about the Nile River. The Nile River flows, f flows south to north. It flows north, which is which is unusual for a lot of, of rivers. But you can see on this picture, I know that it's really small for you, but that red line hopefully will help you be able to see what we're talking about here. That red line, it starts there at that lake in the south and it flows to the Mediterranean Sea. See that? It's flowing north, right? It's flowing north. But you'll notice right there in the middle of Sudan, there's this moment where the Nile River begins to bend west and it keeps bending west so for just a little bit, what's happening is flowing south. But then it makes another bend and it begins to flow north again. Do you see that? But now if you were to ask, does the Nile River flow north or flow south? We'd say, well, it flows north. But if you're standing at that one spot, it's flowing south. You see, the problem with us as Christians is, is that we're, if we're devoted to King Jesus, we're flowing north. But every once in a while, there's this moment in our life where we take a bend. We diverge from God's will and what happens to us. And if somebody were to see that moment in our life, there's been moments in my life 
There were moments in Valerie's testimony that she was sharing. There's been moments in your life probably where if people were to see that particular moment in, the, in your life, they wouldn't believe you're a Christian. That's flowing south. You kidding me? But that's not, that's not, the, that's not the whole story. He says the, 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 the habitual practice of a person who knows Christ is going to be righteousness because they live in devotion to him. They live in submission to God. In this text, when he starts talking about this, when he, he, that habitual practice, when he says no one who makes a practice of sinning, that's what he's describing in us. He's describing there's going to be moments where we falter. He's not talking about sinless perfection. But what he's saying is your life should be marked by righteousness, by Christ's likeness. D. Moody Smith says, the believer may fall into sin, but he will not walk in it. Back to the Nile River uh, illustration. John Phillips says, it's the way that he phrases it that gets us on the Nile River. The flow of the believe, true believer's life is toward obedience and faith. Occasional lapses may occur. Some of them may even be prolonged, but that's not the main trend. The occasional stretches of misdirected sinful behavior represent an interruption in the general trend toward Christ's likeness. And so when we think about our life as believers, the reason that we are able to, to make decisions that honor God, the reason that we're able to live lives of righteousness is because Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil in our life. It's because he has gone to the cross, has paid the penalty, and freed us from our sins. When you look at this passage, let's think for just a minute about that word lawlessness because you know, we talked several weeks ago when we looked at that fifth and sixth seal and we talked about martyrs and rebels and we kind of were on that same theme thinking about the idea of lawlessness, this defiance of God. Because sin is this, sin is this matter of the will. When we choose to assert our will over his will, that's sin. When we think about being apart from him, when we think about before we were saved, that's what we do. We don't know anything but to please self, but to honor self, but to elevate self, but to do what self wants. That's what we do. But when he fills us with his spirit, he changes our, de our desires and he changes our perspective. And even though we still have the flesh, and the flesh has a will of its own, doesn't it? How are the works of the devil destroyed in your life? It's not by listening to the flesh. The works of the devil are destroyed in your life when you submit to God and you, you give over your will, not my will, but your will. You know, when we started this message, we talked about the first reason that the first way that the works of the devil are destroyed is because Jesus went to the cross. You know, Jesus in the garden gives us a great example of that, doesn't he? It wasn't because of some sinful flesh in him, but in that garden, doesn't he pray? This thing that I'm about to go through, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. This is going to be a hard thing. But not my will, but your will be done. In that moment, there was a submission to the work that had to be done, even though it was a thing that was cruel and hard and awful. The Bible tells us that he looked beyond the pain of that moment, and he saw me and you, and he died. It, was, it was for that that he died on the cross and gave himself, destroying the works of the devil. It was by that act of submission to God. And when we're walking with him in Christ-likeness, we're going to do the Christ-like thing, which is submit our will to him. In this moment, when I am overcome by this sin and it seems to be all around me, the Bible promises that there is a way of escape. And that way of escape is revealed to us by God's seed that's, that's living within us. It's possible for us to escape that sin. It's possible for us to have victory over that sin because of his death on the cross, because he was born into that manger, lived 33 and a half years, a perfectly sinless life that none of us could live, and he became a perfect sacrifice. If, we, if, if the wages of sin is death, Jesus bore that at the cross for me and you. He took our punishment on the cross in order that he would ascend out of here and his Holy Spirit would indwell us and he would walk in us and give us the ability 
to submit to him rather than choosing our own will. His spirit that has been given to us is to help us grow. Now, the devil does not want you to grow. The devil wants to hinder your walk at every turn. If you're here today, what, what, what our Lord is doing, what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is going to be doing in our invitation in just a second is he's going to be drawing you to take your next step to Jesus. For some of you, your next step to Jesus is salvation. That's what it is. Some of you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, 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 you're living for self. You can't, you can't think about this moment where, that, where there's been this wrestling within you between flesh and spirit. You can't think about a moment where you put your trust in what he did on the cross, but his Holy Spirit is revealing to you today, you don't know him. And he came to destroy the works of the devil in your life. Surrender your life to him. Submit your life to him. That's the submission to God he's calling you today. Others of you know him as your Lord and Savior, but your next step to Jesus is to surrender. Maybe it's to surrender a thing in your life. Maybe it's to, maybe it's to walk with him through his word, to consider, to pray and, and to read his word every day in order that you might be walking with him so that when that knock does come at the door, you send the right at him. Maybe he's working on you about some other area in your life that I don't even know about. But he's sovereign and he knows and his Holy Spirit works on your life. He longs for you to take your next step toward him, toward Christ, in Christ's likeness. But our enemy, the devil, doesn't want that to happen. He will whisper things in your ear. He will convince you that you are just fine. He will go to great lengths to keep you from honoring the Lord with your life. He hinders it. I can think about one particular morning. Um, it's been a long time ago. I've, I've used this illustration before, um, but it, it seems appropriate for today. I remember uh, many years ago, I was on this trail and I was hiking and it was very early in the morning. And it was kind of overcast. And of course, there's trees over it, shady and I remember that, that, that walking along that trail, every, just every few steps, there was a spider web that was built across the trail. And, and I couldn't see them. You know, it was kind of overcast. It was shady under those trees. And so you're just walking, you know, you're trying to, you know, they're in your mouth and all over you and it's all in your hair stuck to you and you go a little bit further. And, and it was just aggravating, you know? You couldn't enjoy anything around you. It was just, it was slow going and you were just constantly, the whole time I was walking, I was just wiping spider webs off of me. But then the clouds moved out of the way and that sun started to come through the trees. And what began to happen was I could see every one of those spider webs. They were still there. They were still there along the trail. But what I, I just moved over to the edge of the trail when I'd see one, I'd just take my finger and do this. And like a, like a curtain, that spider web would just, and I'd just keep on cruising. The devil longs to hinder your walk. If he can keep you from coming to Jesus, if he can keep you distracted by everything else that's not honoring to God, if he can, if he can convince you to send the, the first Adam to the door, you're not going to progress in your walk toward Christ, your whole Christian walk is going to be. But when he gives you God's seed, he's given, he's shined that light into your life. He has illuminated your life to be able to see every one of those things, to be able to see them clearly. And you have the ability because of the Holy Spirit living in you to submit to what he wants for your life. Do you understand what he's describing in this? The fact that he has come to destroy the works of the devil. This is how, this is how we have victory in our Christian walk. And you'll be cruising. Every time you submit, those things that the devil has put in your path, you're just going to fall out of the way and you're going to keep getting closer to Jesus. And this is what he's called us to do. Why did Jesus come? Why do we love his birth? Because he came for destruction. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He was born in that manger. 
He lived a perfectly sinless life, died on the cross in order that his Holy Spirit can come on you when you surrender to him and you can live in victory to him. You can live in victory. You can have victory in Jesus by submitting to his will every day. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you, those that are going to play a hymn of invitation, if you guys want to come, I want you to think for just a moment about the works of the devil in your own life. It's wonderful to think about this. I mean, the whole point of the message today is to start on this big scale and think about it in, in terms of what Jesus has done on the cross, to think about it in a grand, general way that he has disarmed the works of the devil. He has, he has loosened, he has dissolved the work of the devil by what he did on the cross. But where this message is going is down to that moment where we submit where it's going is down to the decision that you and I make every day when those moments come, when the devil presents his work in your life. So that's where I want you to live for just a minute. Think for just a moment about, is your life this constant struggle? Do you feel like your, your Christian life is this constant struggle of fighting the works of the devil like I was fighting those spider webs that day. To grow in Christ's likeness is to be steadfastly devoted and committed to him. It's every day making little decisions that bring you closer to him. And through the light of his spirit, he renders all of those works of the devil in your life inoperative. When we're walking with Jesus, the works of the devil don't have the same power over us. If you're here and you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have been so for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about because when you're walking close to Jesus, those spider webs seem to fall. But when you are far from him, they seem to trip you up. You're not even able to see them. Your vision's not clear, spiritually speaking. Today, I don't know where you stand with Jesus. But if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you're unable to submit. If you're not walking with him day in and day out, you're unable to submit. And Jesus has paid it all on the cross for me and you. We're fixing to sing about the old rugged cross and and his wonderful work that he did there. He did that. And then he calls you and I to submit to him. Today, are you living in submission to our Lord? Lord, we don't want lawlessness to mark our lives. Lord, our desire is to live a righteous life. So Lord, I pray for the one today that's struggling with their own salvation. Lord, I pray that in just a moment they would come and respond, that that someone would be able to share with them from God's word what it means to trust Christ so they can have victory over their sin. Lord, I pray for the believer that that seems to be hitting spider webs constantly. Lord, I pray that you would shine your illuminating light on their life and help them to be able to walk and grow, move freely in the power of your spirit. Lord, it's our desire today to honor you. And so as we sing, I pray that you would help us to be obedient, surrendering our will to yours. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen.